Well, this morning, our regular Daryl, Daryl, and whoever. Who's the first name? Daryl, Daryl, and Daryl. Okay, are, are not here because Abby's in North Carolina this morning trying to get her way home. So we're going to just sing some favorites. So I've got two favorites. I'm going to choose one more favorite from somebody. Somebody have a favorite they would love to sing this morning? This is my father's, this is my father's world. Okay. Okay, so we're going to sing How Great Thou Art first, and that is page 77 in your hymnal. So would you uh, sing that with us? And then we'll do Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and this is my father's world. All right. 77. I think this would be a good one to stand up on. Would you stand with me? And it's in the red hymnal. This is, or excuse me, how great thou art. Now turn to the black books, the faith we sing, and turn to 2158, and we'll sing just a closer walk with thee. We'll sing the first two verses.
Okay, now back to the red hymnals for 144. This is my father's world. And we'll sing verses one and three. 144. And I just told Steve he can come back every week. We wouldn't mind at all. Well, beloved, it is good to be here uh, together today. A couple of things I want to make sure that I remember to say. One of them is about Faith and Film is tonight? Next week. Faith and Film is next week um, at Shirley Tonkin's house. And Shirley, just waggle your fingers so that you raise your hand. There you go, that's Shirley. So if you have, uh, want to join them in watching a wonderful movie, um, please see Shirley after the service. Um, let's see, there's a couple other things. Well, we're glad to have John Lewis in church this morning because he had a little adventure last week and ended up in the hospital for a couple of days. But now he has uh, added electricity to his body and uh, his heart is just fine. So welcome back, John. We're really glad that you're doing okay. Also, if you haven't had a chance to look at our solar project, we are just days away from having it all plugged in. The electricians have been working on it, and you can see that it's all been, it's all, all 60 panels are up, they all have a charge, they're all capped. Unfortunately, somebody took this opportunity to steal Ken's uh, welder. So that is also a concern, um, it's too bad, and we hope that they will find it in their hearts to return it or something, or the police will find it, but those are among the joys and concerns today. Also, I wanted to let you know of something that really was kind of amazing that happened this week. Um, you know, the, the, the thing about being a downtown church is sometimes the whole parking lot thing becomes an issue, you know, because people get used to using our parking because it's free and that's wonderful. And generally, we don't have any problem with that. But every once in a while, it, it, it's become a sticky issue when we've had church activities that we needed to communicate about. So we've been trying to think for a number of months about how best to deal with being neighborly, but also letting people know that sometimes we need to have the whole parking lot. So we wrote a letter and uh, asked people uh, to, to please feel free to use our parking, but we'd like your information in case of emergencies and so we can contact you. And if you will return this little uh, card with your information, we'll give you your own little parking sticker that says First United Methodist Church on it. So we did that and we got it done and we got that all taken care of. Well then, uh, one of apparently one of our neighbors who uses quite a bit of our parking during the week is Special Olympics. And they called a couple of weeks ago and said, we would really like to thank the church for giving us uh, this opportunity to, to park downtown. So we want to come and have a work day. Well, those folks came this week. The, if you look on our Facebook page, there's pictures. But they brought over 20 volunteers and they cut down all the weeds in the parking lot. They cleaned out the window wells. They washed windows. They polished pews. And uh, we even talked them into maybe coming back for trunk or treat on Halloween. So I am really, really grateful uh, how sometimes when we just try to think creatively about how are we neighbors together in this neighborhood, um, how you can make connections. It was really an amazing day, and I'm really grateful for that, uh, 
for that gift of their volunteer hours. And it was like 100 degrees that day too, so I was really grateful for their work. Um, now, for the last couple of weeks, it's, it's odd how all my little travel out of town things, sometimes I think about them like eight months or nine months out, out, you know, and all of a sudden they're not like in the distant future, they're suddenly right here. So all of them kind of bunched up this month. So if you've wondered if, about me being out of the office, uh, one of my trips was to the Western Jurisdiction meeting planning for uh, uh, our quarter, our every four years meeting. Uh, this year it's going to be in Arizona. So I went in 120 degrees heat to Arizona for a couple of days and worked on that. And then a number of us went to the Camp on the Boulder for a training event with Phil Maynard. Um, a lot of our leadership team was there learning how to, to be disciples of Jesus Christ in a maturing relationship as we become the church together. And that was a wonderful event, and I'm hoping some of our uh, leadership team will share some of that with you. And then this last week I was in Minnesota and uh, was privileged to be chosen uh, for a grant by the Lilly Foundation to go and uh, have a week with other writers and have an opportunity to write about faith and to talk about our writing, and it was just a really great opportunity. So I thank you for, for your patience when I've been in and out of the office a little bit, uh, but they're all things that I hope will enrich our life of faith here together. Okay, and also there's the offering today for the, the vets, rides for the vets, so please uh, attend to that as well. Okay, so beloved of God, as we worship together in the spirit of God and in God's love, let us take a few moments to greet one another in the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another. Please be seated. Beloved, it is always good to have a few moments to reconnect our minds and hearts together. I don't know about you, but there are some times when I sit down to pray and I feel like my mind is like one of those hot griddles that you're getting ready for pancakes. And to test, the, to test to make sure it's hot enough, you know, you just throw a little drop of water on there and the water just skitters across the surface. Well, sometimes when I'm getting ready to pray, that's how I feel. So t this morning as we enter into our, our worship time, let's just take a few moments to rest in the presence of our God, to be present in body and mind and in spirit for God who is with us. Let us pray.
Would you join us in our call to worship? Behold how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Thanks be to our God. All right. Let us sing together hymn number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. There are moments when we pray together that our hearts are just simply filled with a sense of God's presence in our midst. Uh, our Abby, who preached for us last week, which I got to see on YouTube, which was really fun, uh, and um, you all, somebody will get a prize if you can tell me in one sentence what she preached about, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, what's that? Pizza? She, ta she didn't preach about pizza. That was just the illustration. Okay. All right, well, she's in North Carolina uh, this weekend and has been going to the School for Congregational Development, which a number of us went to last year. And uh, she said that the worship is just so amazing that she just practically glows. Well, I think sometimes when we enter into our, our time of worship together, it is a time when we can just be filled with God's glory and love and grace and sometimes even beyond words. But there are also times when we come together with our burdens, with our woundedness, with our disconnectedness, with our worries, with our, with our stress, all of those things that just we carry around with us like baggage. This morning, I want us to surround somebody in prayer, and that somebody is Patrick. Patrick's been uh, with us in worship now for a little over a month. And this week, he uh, lost his son to a car accident. And we, I think, can hold everyone together in this prayer. But in particular, I want to hold Patrick. And if there's those of you who are seated nearby, if you would just lay hands on Patrick, because I think this is an important thing we do as a community of faith. And the rest of us are just gonna surround Patrick and all those others who are in need of love and care this morning. 
So let us pray together. Loving and holy God, we give you thanks that you are present with us in each and every moment. Our hearts sometimes are filled with joy and wonder and stories and, and adventures. And other times, oh God, they are filled with pain beyond words. So for everyone who is in pain this day, we pray. For those who are far away and experiencing the stress and the desire for love and grace and community and who only find violence and fear, we pray. And in these moments, in and through our family, Patrick, we realize that the loss of a child, someone whom we love, someone we want only good things for, is beyond our comprehension. And so as we pray for Patrick this day, we too pray for all of those who are struggling, who are in need, who wonder if you are present. Because, oh God, we are powerful in prayer together. We surround Patrick and all of those who are in great need in your love, in your grace, in an awareness, oh God, that the wounds that we cannot name, let alone open for healing, that you are capable of loving us, of granting us healing, and of comfort and of strength. And so in and through and around your love in these moments, oh God, we pray in the power of our Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved of God, we are connected through the power and the love of Christ. As maturing disciples of Christ, we go beyond just a belief in the mind, but we believe that our God touches us in so many different ways, reaching toward us in a yearning for relationship, that all that we believe about God and all that we believe about Christ should not ever just stay at this level. Rather, beloved of God, we as maturing disciples of Jesus Christ encourage one another to go beyond just believing in an intellectual concept of Jesus. We take that concept and we belong to Jesus. And by belonging to Jesus and growing in faith, that restores not only our relationship with God and one another, but it gives us the opportunity to serve and to join Jesus in serving the world. One of those opportunities is every week, we give one another the, the chance to give something back, to be aware that the goodness of God is more powerful and more extravagant than we can possibly imagine. And so together, we bring in humility our gifts that we can share in the mission and the ministry of Jesus the Christ. Let us give.
I want you to join me in the unison prayer, but what's on the screen is different from what I have in the bulletin. Lord, let's read the bulletin. Will you join me? We're not using it. Thank you. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Here's the citadel of all my desiring, where my hopes are born and all the deep resolutions of my spirit take wings. In this center, my fears are nourished and all my hates are nurtured. Here my loves are cherished and all the deep hungers of my spirit are honored without quivering and without shock. In my heart, above all else, let love and integrity envelop me until my love is perfected and the last vestige of my desiring is no longer in conflict with thy spirit. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, I forgot to ask you again. Abby's sermon in one sentence, besides pizza. What was Abby's sermon last week in one sentence? Serving. Love serving? Love and acceptance? Anybody else? Just checking, I watched the YouTube. Just a good reminder too that our services are all on YouTube now, so if you miss one, you know where you can go. Does anybody here know how to juggle? Anybody, you really do? Oh, Beth, come here. <laughs> she didn't know she'd be doing this today on her way home from vacation. Okay then. Oh my goodness. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. That is awesome. You never know when you come to church here. So next time you may, uh, they're on their way home from vacation and, and who knew that, that they'd be called upon to know how to juggle. Okay, a, a number of years ago I thought, wouldn't it be great to know how to juggle? So I bought the little, you know, the little balls you can get at Barnes and Noble and I read the little book because, you know, if I want to learn something, that's what I always do. I take a book, you know, that's how I learn things. But not so much juggling. So there's this, there's this part of juggling where you, you, know, you start with one ball, right? Did you learn it that way where you learn with one ball and then pretty soon you start with two balls and then I never got past the two balls and it wasn't very pretty. So how long did it take you to learn how to juggle? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you weren't studying, you were just learning how to juggle. That is so cool. And she probably has lots better eye-hand coordination than I do. There's a reason that I do not play the organ. I was thinking today about how it is. Now this is our, our if I were to try to describe what we're gonna be working on together as church for this next nine months, it would be this. We are going to be learning how to be disciples so that we can make disciples. And it's not that I don't think we know how to do this. I think that we do this really rather well at times. But one of the things the leadership team and I are working on, as well as the whole church, is, is sometimes we have just so taken for granted that being a member of a congregation is the same as being a disciple that we've kind of forgotten what that whole discipling process looks like. Now, if you um, are up with some of the, the current fun books to read, you may have read The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And in Malcolm Gladwell's book, he talks about if you are a musician or an athlete or just want to become an expert or excel at something, that you have to have determined practice at it. And in his book, he, he cites a study, and then there's been all sorts of controversy about it, but I won't go into that. There's been this study that says, to really become excellent as a musician, or as a, 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 a sports person, or I'm gonna say, as a disciple of Jesus, to become exceptional at it takes, does anybody know the number? It takes 10,000 
hours. Now, you were so brilliant that it didn't take you 10,000 hours to learn how to juggle. It probably would take me. I'm just guessing here because I've tried it a few times. But what I want us to contemplate today, and you'll probably be getting tired of me saying, is the whole thing that we do here, and we're, we're going to be papering the walls with our little purpose statement, which was your three words, and I'm going to have you say it with me, connect, serve, or oops, I did it backwards. Connect, grow, serve. Let's say it together. Connect, grow, serve. And that pretty much, um, you can watch the rest on YouTube because that's what we're going to be talking about for the next year. Um, so you have a hint about what that is. But as I consider my walk as a disciple, um, as, a, as someone who wants to belong, as someone who wants to be in relationship with Jesus, as somebody who wants to be more like Jesus and to join Jesus in whatever Jesus is up to, it means that I have to figure out that I want it badly enough to practice. To practice. And in order to learn anything, it means that there's going to be a learning curve. Sometimes we get stuck in one place or another, like I got stuck with, I could do the one ball pretty well. You know, you just do that one ball in one hand. And then I almost got to where I could do thump, 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 thump with, I'm not even gonna demonstrate now because I know I couldn't do it. But I never could, I wasn't really all that excited about it enough to give up most of my life for a week or two or five to learn how to juggle. It didn't, it didn't mean enough to me. So what I want us to think about today is do I want it enough? Do I want it enough to be a mature disciple of Jesus the Christ? Isn't it wonderful to have music so much part of our church life? Thank you. Our epistle lesson is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, 
and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, and compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please join us in our song of preparation. This morning's text is from the Gospel of Matthew. And before I read it, um, I'm, I'm gonna have to say a couple of things. Because first of all, this is one of the texts that most of us as pastors and preachers would like to avoid whenever possible. Because we think about Jesus in a certain way. When we think about what Jesus says and what Jesus does, I have an image of what I can expect from Jesus and this particular passage doesn't meet my standards. This morning, as we're continuing our conversation about discipleship and, and what it all means and how much practice we take, we, it's really easy for us to imagine how much time it must have taken the disciples to get it. In fact, really, they didn't get it while Jesus was their teacher at all. Now, prior to, in the chapter that comes right before this story in 15, we find Jesus and the guys doing a lot of stuff. They're traveling all over the Galilee, they're venturing out into the Samaritan territories, they're going back and forth the lake. Uh, they, there's been a mass feeding of over 4,000 people. The, Jesus has been called upon to teach. Jesus has been called upon to heal people. And back and forth they go, um, con confronting people who are, who are wondering who Jesus is. And by this time, they've just got to be exhausted. You know that kind of exhausted we get, and, and every time I'm in an airport, usually I'm in that state of exhaustion where you think, if people will just kind of leave me alone for a minute, all will be well. So right at this point in the story, I am imagining Jesus and the guys are starting to get on each other's nerves. Now, our visitors today have been together in a fifth wheel for two months, and I'm thinking, you know about this. You know the whole getting on our last nerves. We've been together too much. We've, um, we've gotten tired. We've sometimes gotten hungry. We, we need to take a shower. We just need to take a break. And so they've gone through all of these adventures together. And they've gone into uh, where, where they hope, well, they'll have a little bit of time probably. They've gone to the land of Tyre and Sidon. 
which is just again across the lake in the Samaritan territories. And I'm imagining that Jesus is just about having his last nerve stepped on by the fellas because this is right after they've gone across the lake and you remember the story where, where Peter uh, sees Jesus walking towards them and he says, oh, I wanna do that. And then of course he immediately says, whoops, thump, and, and Jesus has to save him and, and Jesus goes on to say, oh, Peter, I love you, honey, but you just, you just need to learn about this faith thing. So I can just imagine as a preface to this story that Jesus is tired. He has just about reached the end of his rope with the guys. He's probably sent them off, in fact, to go to McDonald's and pick up a snack because he just wants five minutes to himself. And that's where the story, I think, may have started. So Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We've been hearing stories about the Jewish teacher who had been going all around the territories. And, and it seemed as if he was, he was just going everywhere. First he was in the Gennesaret, and then he was down in Galilee, and, and he seemed to be crossing over. And even though my people are not of the Jews, and even though our people are traditional enemies, even though we wouldn't eat together or sit at the same table together, or even if we wouldn't walk the same roads together, There was just something to these stories. My sister told me not to go. She said, he's not gonna help you anyway. Those Jewish people, they don't think we're really people at all. They just think we're animals. But I went anyway. I can't remember a day when my daughter was not ill. I cannot remember a day where she slept through the night. I cannot remember a time when she laughed without ever thinking about it. I saw them in the distance and I wasn't, I wasn't sure. What if, he, what if he just told me to go away? Master? Master? They just kept walking. It looked to me like they were walking walking toward us and, Master, Son of David, Master? They just ignored me and kept walking. Master, Son of David, help me, please, please help me. My, my daughter is tormented by a demon. He, he said something that didn't surprise me at all. He said, hey, not my job. I have come for the household of Israel. Of course he did. It's what I expected. Then he said something I didn't expect. All the stories of him seem so real and so kind and so generous. And he said, why should I throw the children's food to the dogs. Oh, I know that there are people that think of my people, the Canaanite people, as being no better than animals. 
you know, and I didn't really even care what he thought of me. Son of David, help me. Help me. It was then that he smiled. <laughs> then when he said, woman, get up, for I see your faith. But it wasn't until I said these words, Lord, even the dogs under the master's table get the crumbs. I didn't care what he thought of me. I didn't care if he liked me. I didn't care if he thought I was the dregs of the earth. All I cared about in that moment was my daughter and I knew I knew that he could do something. And then he touched me and he raised me up on my feet and he said, that's what faith looks like. I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know whether to, to trust that what he said next was really going to happen. But somehow there was a look in his eyes that I had to take seriously and so I went home. And for the first time, and I can't even count when, my daughter was herself, and she was well. Now this story of Jesus is disturbing for me. When I think about Jesus talking to this woman as if she were a non-human being, I want to slap him upside the head. I gotta tell you, I don't like it. What does it mean that Jesus speaks to this foreign woman, this non-Jewish woman, as if she were a non-person? That's not the Jesus that I love. And then I think about it because I gotta tell you, this is one of those avoidance scriptures that when it comes up in the lectionary, pastors go, I'm sure there's something else I'd rather preach on. So whose learning curve is this story about? Is this a story about a Canaanite woman who learned that all she needed to do was ask and believe no matter what? Is this a story about a learning curve of the disciples who believed that Jesus was just their own personal Messiah? Because we sure know that that's what they thought. Is this a story about the learning curve of Jesus? Ooh, now this is where it gets sticky, doesn't it? Because we think Jesus should have it all figured out by now. I mean, this is chapter 15. If he's a little unsure at the beginning of the book by now, he must know what his job is. But I can almost imagine it. I can almost imagine Jesus saying at the, at the end of what must have been a horrifically difficult period of time, saying, you know, my plate, my plate is so full already. Everywhere I go, I am hounded by people who want something of me and I just can't do it all. And this woman reminds him and says, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all. Because after all, isn't it God who is doing it with you? Now she said it by saying, don't even the dogs under the master's table get the crumbs. The master wasn't trying to throw out crumbs. The master was just trying to serve the meal. And yet where the spirit of God's love is, that extravagant generosity, that amazing love and forgiveness and acceptance, even if Jesus in his own mind, and I know this is pretty controversial stuff I'm talking about, so if you're uncomfortable, good, I am too. But let's imagine Jesus growing into what it means to be the savior, not just of a small group of people, no matter how much we want that, but Jesus as being the savior of the world. And maybe he just at this point hadn't quite got his mind wrapped around 
that as limited as we are in time and energy and resources and faith and energy and all of those things, that God's intention for humanity is so much bigger than we can possibly even imagine. Maybe even bigger than Jesus could have imagined. So maybe part of this story, and this is the discomfort again, part of this story might have been, here is Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, Prince of Peace, realizing in the humble kneeling of a woman that he normally wouldn't talk to, that God was much more interested in loving everybody than just a small group of human beings. And isn't that really what our task as disciples are? It isn't our task as disciples to decide who's in and who's out. It isn't our task as disciples to decide how much energy we have, although I know sometimes we run out. Because what we forget as disciples, and maybe even once in a while Jesus forgot this, is that we're not alone. It is our God through the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do more, to dream more, to love more, to heal more, to pray more than any of us could possibly imagine. Now maybe Jesus already knew all of those things. Maybe it was just a learning experience for the disciples or for the Canaanite woman or for the other followers. But no matter which way the story goes, no matter what the true version of the, of the story is, everything from that moment changed. It wasn't just about a tribal people anymore. It wasn't just about the people who look like us or act like us or worship like us or value the same things that we value or show up in the right place at the right time. The Spirit of God is in this place and it's going to take us a whole lot of practice to catch up. And I think we can. Thanks be to our God. Amen. Would you join us in singing our closing hymn? This is one Abby was uh, working with you on last week and I think we can get it because there is a little misprint there. So I'm going to ask you to please stand and uh, we'll sing it, sing the two verses. us to be disciples, to be children of God, to be friends, to be movers and shakers, to be those people that aren't just thinkers, but doers. In these moments, we ask in the name of our Christ that our believing, that our consent, that our intention 
would not just be in alignment with God's purposes, but in these moments, O oh God of power and grace, you would give us the will to practice, to be, to do. Amen. Go in peace.